Let me pray for us this morning. Father, we thank you again uh, for all you've given us, Lord, for the ways in which you've protected us and provided for us. And, and, and Lord, uh, this month especially, we're thankful for the families that have reached out, that have loved, that have adopted, or that have fostered, or that are part of Safe Families, or, or any other number, Lord, of organizations, uh, all designed to love and help children and families. And so we're thankful that we're a small part of that, Lord. I pray that you would continue to give our people a heart for this ministry, a heart to love and to share. Father, we're thankful that you've adopted us into your family through the salvation of Jesus Christ. Father, I pray that you would just allow us this morning now as we, as we think about your word and, and think about your goodness, help us just to hear from you, Lord, to be challenged, to be encouraged, to be transformed, to, to be changed, Lord, more and more into the image of your son, Jesus Christ. It's in his name we pray. Amen. Take your Bibles open to 1 Peter chapter 4. <clears throat> 1 Peter chapter 4, kind of towards the end of the New Testament, we're working our way through a sermon series on vision. We've been thinking over the last several weeks, really, uh, about what the Lord has done. We've celebrated all that the Lord has done, but we're looking with anticipation to all that he's going to do. And so there are a lot of things that this church will be thinking about, praying about in, in the weeks and months to come, for sure. But I really want you to know and understand before we uh, make big decisions or before we think about building things or expanding whatever we've got to expand, we've got to understand within our hearts as followers of Jesus that we've got to be different. We have to think differently. We have to respond differently. So this sermon is really about the heart of the believer. It's about how we should be thinking, how we should be living. Uh, we've talked about things that maybe aren't new to you, but maybe areas you need to be reminded of. And this morning's going to be one of those. It's probably not going to be some groundbreaking information you're going to hear, but it's that slow, steady, ongoing reminder of how we should live. I've given you each week the Rosemont vision, and we do that just to kind of remind you of what we're trying to accomplish. We want every person to connect to Jesus and his church, grow in faith and understanding of God's word, and then serve Jesus here and around the world. And God has blessed us in a lot of ways. And we've been talking over the last several weeks, we did this during our vision night, but over the last several weeks, just our growth in so many different areas and the numbers of people that are coming, all the things he's doing with the mission house. Praise the Lord for that. You heard on the announcements, just to reiterate, this Saturday, show up, park in the parking lot here. We'll walk across together together. We'll serve you lunch if you want to stay that long, and hopefully we'll be done early afternoon. We just got a lot of cleanup to do, so bring gloves. If you got some tools you think can help tear out carpet or appliances even or yard work, bring what you think that you can use and what's needed, and uh, we'll see what the Lord does. But I'm excited about what he's going to do with his house. I'm excited about the connection people have made. I told our, our team earlier this week that for me, whenever we lead to do something, it's always exciting to see the body rally around it, right, and get excited. And I've had so many people reach out. So many people want to be a part of, and so we would love for you to serve. Or you can give towards that if you want to. You can come and work on Saturday. There will be other opportunities. But you just be in prayer that the Lord would use this property for his honor and would allow us to continue to reach the world for Jesus. So we've been going through this vision series. We've been thinking about the future. We've been praying about the future. We've been thinking about what the Lord is doing in our lives and what he wants to do. And I've been asking a question each week that I want you to answer it's very simple. How can we be faithful to continue to reach the world for Jesus? What's it going to take for Rosemont to continue and what we've done for the last 57 years to go for decades more reaching the world for Jesus? So this morning, we're going to be in 1 Peter chapter 4. We're going to talk about an idea that's really foundational to the Christian walk. It's something we probably all know and understand. The question, really, this is always the question, are we really living it out? How are you living these truths out in your life? So let's look at 1 Peter chapter 4 this morning, beginning in verse 8. Above all, right, that's really important. Above all, keep loving one another earnestly. Like if you don't get anything else from this sermon, you need to underline that little phrase. We should be loving one another earnestly since love covers a multitude of sins. Show hospitality to one another without grumbling, right? Maybe circle that, some of y'all, amen, circle that underneath. Verse 10, as each has received a gift, use it to serve one another as good stewards of God's varied grace. Whoever speaks as one who speaks oracles of God, whoever serves 
as one who serves by the strength that God supplies in order that in everything God may be glorified through Jesus Christ. To him belong glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. Right? So we're thinking about vision. We're thinking about moving ahead. We're thinking about our hearts and answering the question, how can we be faithful to continue to reach the world for Jesus? We can do it, number one, by loving one another. We must love one another. Now, Paul is looking ahead in this chapter and really in this book, and he's thinking oftentimes about persecution. He's thinking about the struggles that, that people face, and he's reminding them that really no matter the circumstances, no matter the situation, no matter what happens in the future, there's this foundational truth that we find that we should live by. And he says in verse 8, above all. So really more important than above everything else. Take the highest point here. This is the most important thing. Above all, we should love one another. Right? Now this isn't confusing. It's not misleading. It's very straightforward. We should love one one another. And we know this is important because we see it in other places of Scripture, right? In fact, we, we hear this command time and time again, especially in the New Testament. For example, 1 John 3, 11, for this is the message that you've heard from the beginning that we should love one another. Galatians 5, 14, for the entire law is fulfilled in keeping this one command, love your neighbor as yourself. John 13, 34, this is Jesus speaking, a new command I give you, love one another, right? There's this profound idea scripturally, time and time again, that we should love one another. And what a great time to think about this month adoption, right? As we think about the love that families have shown to these precious children, we think about the, the, the sacrifices that they make financially, right, physically, emotionally, all the things that they do and that they give and all of the, the love that they have in their heart to, to bring these children into their family. And I, I love this idea because it's a picture of what Jesus does for us, isn't it? Right? Adoption is a picture of what the Lord does for us. Jesus reaches down and rescues us and allows us now to become part of his family. And so we've all as believers experienced this on some level. We've all experienced the love of Christ and been adopted into his family. And so this, this idea of love of the Lord and of Christ and of others, is just kind of foundational to everything we do as believers. But here's where I want to think about this with you just for a few minutes. Why do we have to have so many verses on this? It's an interesting thought. I mean, time and time again, we see this love one another, love one another, love one another, right? We, we would think that we would get it after the first few times and we would live it. We understand that the writers of the New Testament and even the Old Testament have to continue to bring it up. Why? Because sometimes it's hard to love people. Amen? Because some people are crazy, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> and we all know them. Don't look at them right now. Don't look at them right now. Don't look at them right now. We know them. It's difficult sometimes to love people. But I love what Peter says here because he talks about loving people in verse 8. Above all, keep loving one another earnestly since love covers a multitude of sins. And amen for that. Praise the Lord for that. Right? We love, Amy and I joke, we love in spite of, don't we? Right? Because if you're not yet married or you're newly married, just a clue in, your spouse ain't perfect. Right? And Amy can, can attest to that, I promise. There are plenty of times I mess it up at home, right? And there are times she does things that I don't like as well, right? But we love in spite of, don't we? Because love covers a multitude of sins. And so we, we read this and, and we think about this and we're like, you know, I, I get the calling here. I know that it's not easy, but it's something I need to be doing. It's something I need to be thinking about. It's something I need to be intentional with, something I need to be aware of, something I need to be praying through. Why? Because this is how the world's going to know us. Right? This is one of the defining characteristics of believers that they love one another. Right? When, when, when people come into their church, they want to understand that we actually do love each other, Right? There are things that we're going to do for one another. We're, we're going to demonstrate and we're going to live out our lives in such a way that the love of Christ kind of flows through us. 
You say, but I, you know, if you knew this person, Adam, if you knew, I get it. I'm not saying it's easy. But I'm saying it's a clear commandment in Scripture. We always joke that the, the motto sometimes in life ought to be, uh, you ain't got to like them, you just got to love them, right? And, and if you got children, you, you know, you get that. <laughs> Middle school years, you know, you might not like them a lot, but you still love them. You might not like the way they think or the way they act or the way they treat others. Or You might not like a lot about them, but you're called to love. And this is the, the foundational, fundamental calling of believers, right? And when we do this, guess what? The Lord sees it. The Lord is glorified. We'll see just a minute. But the world recognizes there's something different about those Christians. I mean, if I want a group of people that are mad at each other and hate each other, I, there's all kinds of places I can go to see that. Rare is the place you can go where people truly love one another. This is the calling, right? This is foundational. So if we're going to continue to reach the world, if we're going to continue to see the Lord work in our midst, it starts with our love for one another. Now look at verse 8 again. It's going to get a little more difficult. It always does, right, scripturally. That's the easy part. Look at verse 8. Above all, Keep loving one another earnestly, right? There's an ongoing process. We really mean it. It's important. Since love covers a multitude of sins. Now here it becomes a little more difficult. Show hospitality to one another without grumbling. As each has received a gift, use it to serve one another as good stewards of God's varied grace. Let's stop there, right? We're, we're faithful to continue to reach the world for Jesus when we love one another. But here's a little more difficult proposition, truth number two. We must now serve one another as well. Right? We got to love one another, yes. It starts there, but it leads to a place of service. Right? Real, true, genuine love always leads to action. It always does. If you show somebody that really loves somebody else, I'll show you a life of sacrifice to that person. It's easy to say it. It's easy to say it. It's sometimes very difficult to live it. But we love it when people are nice to us, don't we? We love it when people do nice things. They're kind to us. They demonstrate their love. We, we like those things. Those of you that wrote cards last month, we kind of did a little thing, a pastor appreciation thing, and I received, and our, our whole team received a lot of cards that people wrote, and I got several on my desk in the weeks that followed. Thank you for that. If you write me a card, I promise you I'm going to read it, and I promise you I'm going to think about it. It's going to mean something to me. And I took that box, and I spent an entire afternoon. I just set that time aside in order to read these and to think through these, and to be thankful that we've got such an amazing church. But when you write those cards, it means a lot to me personally. And so thank you for doing that. But we like it when people demonstrate their love for us, don't we? We, we like it when they, when, they, when they show that love, when they live it out in such a way that it's tangible, and we can see it demonstrated throughout their life. We like that. Now, this isn't a sermon on marriage, but I just wonder how many marriages could be healed, repaired, fixed, whatever, could be amazing if each person just tried to demonstrate their love by outserving the other. Man, you talk about a, a, a revival of marriages. Talk about a revival in the home. Imagine how much that would change the, 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 just the overall feel of the home. Imagine how that would change how the husband and the wife interact with one another. Imagine how, how that would change the little child that probably doesn't say a whole lot but is listening to everything mommy and daddy say to each other. Right? Genuine love leads to action and it leads to service. And I would argue, and again, that's not the point of this sermon, but I would argue it really begins in the home. You know, when I... When I do premarital counseling, and I do a lot of that with young couples. I always start in Ephesians because it gives a real clear picture of the husband and the wife. Husbands, love your wife as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. Husbands, you know what your job in the house is? Serve your wife. Not easy. Not something you always want to do but something we ought to strive for, right? I'm going to serve. I'm going to give. I wonder how many homes would change if we just kind of live this out in our home. I wonder how many places of business would change if we live this out in front of the people that we work with. Just a real desire to serve others. A real desire to earnestly love others. 
a, a real desire to, to make a, a difference. Not just talking about it, not just desiring to do it, not just wishing we could, actually living it out. And so Peter gives us some, some ideas here in verse 9. He says, show hospitality to one another, right? That's, that's a beautiful thing. It's a little different for us now, but in the first century, especially in the early centuries when this was written, hospitality was a big deal because a lot of people traveled and they didn't have the hotels like they have now. And so people would have to stay in other people's homes. And so there was this idea that the Christians were known for welcoming strangers into their homes, feeding, providing for them, and then helping them on their way. It looks a little bit different for us now, but how are you hospitable to the people that you live around? That's a good place to start. Do you show hospitality to your neighbors? Right? What, what are the things you're doing to, to love them? What are the things you're doing to demonstrate your love for them? How are you serving them? And then he kind of adds a little tag there at the end of verse 9 without grumbling, right? Attitude matters. When you do something but you tell everybody how much it stinks, it kind of loses its luster, doesn't it? I don't really want to, but I'm going to go cut that grass, grass I guess, because Adam said I needed to. I mean, eh, I don't know. I do that grumbling. Be happy. This is a gift the Lord has given you. Right? So show hospitality. And then he gets even into a little more specifics there in verse 10. As each has received a gift, use it to serve one another. There's an interesting scriptural idea. We call these spiritual gifts. There's an interesting scriptural idea that says, and we see it time and time again, that every person is gifted in a certain area. Every person. And I'm talking to you, by the way. You might not think you are. You might not fully understand what that means, but you have a gift that the Lord has given to you. And what you may not understand is that gift is to be used to enhance and to help grow the body of Christ. Right? So you should figure out what your gift is. You should figure out how you can use that gift to serve others and to build his kingdom. I have a quote that I've seen before, and I, I love it because it, it really resonates with me. It said, everybody is a genius. But if you judge a fish by its ability to climb a tree, it will live its life believing that it's stupid. That's pretty profound, isn't it? I mean, so many people try to figure out what they're good at and they, they, they find the wrong area and they, they, they start working or serving or doing things in the wrong area and they can't figure out why they don't feel fulfilled. It's probably because they're not serving in their area of giftedness. Right? I see this now, especially with college students and trying to figure out where you're going to go, what you're going to do, right? What you're going to do in life. You, you, I, I bet none of y'all are 100% certain on anything at this moment, are you? Anybody 100% certain on anything? No? A couple of you, three of you? Any of y'all 100% certain on anything? Yeah? Mm. It's, a, it's a process, right? But figuring out what you're good at. What am I gifted in? What, here's a way to start. What are the things I'm passionate about? Let's start there. Like, you find something you're passionate about, you never have to work a day of your life. You've heard that saying. We've all heard that before, right? It's like that within the body of Christ. God has given you a gift. And you might think that it's not really important. You might think that it's kind of minuscule. And, and in fact, in, in a church this size, you're probably looking around and going, you know, if I don't serve, ain't nobody will notice. I mean, there's tons of people here. Somebody else will pick up the slack. Somebody else will do it. And that might be the case, but you're missing the, the truth, first of all, the calling of the Lord on your life, that you have a place. But you're also, now watch, you're missing the blessing of serving in an area that the Lord has gifted you to serve in. There's nothing quite as fulfilling, in my opinion, as being in the will of the Lord and serving him faithfully. There's nothing quite like that. And if you've ever experienced that, you know what I mean. You know, we, we read about this scripturally. Paul, Paul talks about this in 1 Corinthians 12. I'm going to read a few verses because I think they're important for us to hear. Paul says in 1 Corinthians 12, beginning, beginning in verse 12, For just as the body is one and has many members... And all of the members of the body, though many, are one body. So it is with Christ, he says. For the body does not consist of one member, but of many. Now listen, if the foot should say, because I'm not a hand, I do not belong to the body, that would not make it any less part of the body. If the ear should say, because I'm not an eye, I do not belong to the body, that would not make it any less part of the body. If the whole body were an eye, where would the sense of hearing be? If the whole body were an ear, where would the sense of smell? 
But as it is, God arranged the members in the body, each one of them as he chose. If all were a single member, where would the body be? As it is, there are many parts, yet one body. Right? We, we all have a place to serve. We all have a place to function. And I would argue biblically that if you're not serving on some level, especially in your area of giftedness, our church is not reaching its maximum potential. Jonas and I went out of town. I talked about this a couple of weeks ago just for a father-son thing several weeks ago and did some college tours and toured some cities. And we went to Detroit and went to the Dearborn, Michigan Ford plant where they make the F-150 truck. It's a pretty incredible, sprawling, it's like a Kia. I mean, it's the size, I think a little bit bigger than Kia. I think three or 4,000 people work there. But you can tour the plant and you can actually walk in and walk over the production floor. And so they've got all these big catwalks and all these open places. And you can kind of look down and you can literally see them making the truck. And I've never seen it in person. I've seen videos and it's, it's kind of a fascinating process because they say it takes about five hours from beginning to end to build a truck. But once that thing gets rolling, one comes off the line about every 55 seconds. And so you go down there at the end and you watch and the truck rolls off and 55 seconds later, another one. But the fascinating part about this, and this is what Henry Ford was brilliant at, creating this process where everybody's got a very specific role. Right? We know how it works. There, there's one guy that puts a steering wheel on. You can watch that one guy and he puts a steering wheel on and the, the, the line is probably, it's probably about from here to the wall and the whole thing moves. And so the truck's on the middle, the whole line is moving. The guy with the steering wheel's waiting and it's moving pretty slow. And when it gets to about him, he steps on and now he's moving with the truck for you know, 20, 30 feet. He puts the steering wheel on. There's another person that comes in and puts the bolts in. There's another person that puts the mirror. Everybody's got a very specific job. And as long as everybody is doing their job, that thing runs very efficiently and a truck is produced every 55 seconds. When one person stops and one part breaks down, guess what? The whole line shuts down. When the guy can't put the steering wheel on, the next guy can't put this on, the next lady can't put, they have to stop everything and now they're down. And now 3,000 people are just kind of twiddling their thumb. What are we going to do for the next 10 minutes till they fix this machine? Now, that's easy to see in a Ford plant, right? It's easy to see in a car manufacturing process. We get that. Harder to see in a church. But I would say to you that there are people that are called to do this, and they're not doing it. And so production for us is minimized because we're not doing the things we've been called to do. What's your role? What are you good at? What's your area of service that you can be a part of and increase the ability of this church to reach the world for Jesus. Now, I'm going to give you a few practical things, right? I always like to help you think through and how to apply some of these things. And so here are kind of some practical ways you can serve. The first one is church ministry needs, right? There's a, there's a ton of opportunity just on this campus. I mean, we, we, we need lots and lots and lots of people to run preschool, to run children, to run our students, to do life groups, to do Wednesday night stuff, to do Sunday morning in here, to park. There are all sorts of opportunities for you to serve locally at this church on this campus. I would encourage you, everybody ought to be doing something. Everybody ought to have some place of service, some role that they're responsible for. Here's another way of service. Adoption, foster care, safe family, etc. You say, I, 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 don't, I don't know that I'm called to adopt, or, or maybe you are. Well, there are other things you can do. You don't even have to have children in your home to be part of this process. You can help resource the families that are doing it, right? When you do safe families or, or fostering uh, stuff, you can go help the families that are bringing these kids in. There's all sorts of ways you can be part of these ministries without actually bringing kids in your home. Maybe you feel like I need to bring kids in my home. There's training for that. We've got opportunities. I can put you in touch with the people that will help you do that. We try to create at this church opportunities for you to be involved, opportunities for you to serve. This is one of those opportunities. Here's a third thing you can do, mission trips, local mission work. You're like, I don't know, there's not anything on Sunday morning I can do, which, by the way, is not true, but you, maybe you think that. You think, I don't really feel called to, to foster or to adopt or be part of safe families. How about a mission trip? How about some local mission work? How about a regular, ongoing mission project here in town? And how about something you can be a part of on a regular 
basis, right? There are all sorts of chances for you to go overseas, chances for you to go outside of the state, chances for you to do things right here, right now on a regular basis. And then if none of those fit, number four, just random ways every day, figure out how you can serve. I, you're a believer. You're called to love. That love should lead you to a place of hospitality, to a place of service. It should lead you to action. So if you're not serving in any other way, you need to figure out how you can love people around you, how you can randomly serve people every single day. Maybe you can start with your neighbors. Maybe you could invite all your neighbors to dinner for a cookout. That'd be one great way to start the process. Maybe you could randomly go cut somebody's grass one week, right? Maybe you can go pressure wash their driveway. Maybe you can help them fix something that you know is broken at their house. There are, there are a thousand different ways you can live this out. But we're called to live this way. We're called to serve. We're called to give, right? So the love leads to hospitality, to service, to tangible things. And then I want you to notice what happens. Look at verse 11 again, 1 Peter chapter 4. Whoever speaks is one who speaks oracles of God. Whoever serves is one who serves by the strength that God supplies. Watch. In order that, here's the, here's the result, in everything, God may be glorified through Jesus Christ. To him belong glory and dominion forever and ever. How can we be faithful to continue to reach the world for Jesus? We must glorify God in the way we live. We got to live in such a way by loving by showing hospitality, by serving, that the Lord is honored and the Lord receives glory. Now, just a side note here to be aware, as you love and as you serve and as you give, it's the Lord that's called to receive glory, not you. And sometimes we get that backwards. You're like, man, if I do this for people, they'll see me. They'll think about how good I am. They'll think about how smart I am and how much I love the Lord and how much I serve the church. No, 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 that's not what we're getting at here. Right? We do this so the Lord can receive glory. We do this so the Lord is honored. We do this so his kingdom grows. Right? God has given us these gifts. Watch now. He delights in seeing us use them. You ever given somebody, you know, it's coming up on Christmas now, and, and I know I know all the men here have got all the Christmas lists ready to buy, right? You got everything lined up, ready to go? Yeah? No, we know that doesn't happen like that. Have you ever <clears throat> bought somebody a nice gift? Maybe you thought about it for a while, you saved up for, you, something you, you really put some real thought into, and when you gave it to that person, a couple of weeks later, you saw them using it or wearing it or, or doing something with it. It makes you feel good. You're like, man, they, they must have really liked that. That was a really good gift. Imagine if you walked into a, a Goodwill later that week and you saw it sitting on the shelf. You'd be like, what? I spent all this time and effort, man. I, I thought about this. I really tried to think about what this person would like, and I really thought they would like this, and they don't care. Imagine when the Lord gifts you with something specific that he wants you to use, and you just keep it on the shelf. You can imagine, Right? When we serve in the areas that he calls us to serve, when we use his gifts, he receives glory. One writer said it like this, everything a man possesses, whether it's an extraordinary spiritual faculty or merely some humdrum aptitude, is on truth, excuse me, is on trust to him from God and so ought to be expended for the good of his fellow Christians. 1 Corinthians 10, 31. So whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do it all for the glory of the Lord. You know, God has done and is continuing to do exciting things here at this church. And we all want to continue to see him work. We all want to continue to see souls being changed, baptisms, adoptions, all the things we're doing to change people, to lead them to Christ. We want all those things to happen. We want him to be faithful for many, many, many more years. But it starts in our hearts as believers, as the church, right? Loving one another. Allowing people to see the love we have for each other. And then it leads us to a place of service, right? serving one another, giving ourselves for others. And then when we do that, when we love and we show hospitality and we serve, the Lord is 
glorified. Right? Our church will only continue to be successful if we love one another, serve one another, bring glory to the Lord. When we do those things, it's a recipe, right, for the blessings of the Lord to allow us to continue to reach people with the gospel for years and years to come for his honor and for his glory. Let's pray. Father, we thank you again for the truth of your word, the clarity of your word, this simple but maybe difficult formula that we see here, Father. It's called to love one another earnestly, regularly, ongoing, to sacrifice for one another, to show hospitality, to, to serve. And Father, I, I pray that idea of service is really just kind of resonating in our, in our hearts and our minds right now. Lord, where do you want us to serve? What's our area of giftedness? How would you call us to love others tangibly? How would you call us to live this out? And then, Lord, we know when we do these things, you receive glory. And so continue to work in our midst in this church. Do great things, and we'll praise your name for all that you accomplish. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You can stand. The altar is open as it is every Sunday. You can come and pray. Speak to me. You respond as we sing together.